we are at the final chapter of the Fail Saga, and whoo, boy, what a ride it's been. I know there's a lot of other companies I haven't even touched, but here's the thing. A lot of them surprisingly don't have enough fails to constitute a top 10 list, and others I've already tackled in other videos. Now, if a particularly abysmal fail from any company comes up moving forward, I'll try and figure out how to address it. But until then, this will be the last video to take on a specific company, and I've saved the best for last. Hold it! Oscar, what are you- If you're finally tearing into Nintendo, I want in. Okay. I won't take no for an answer. A lot of us have been dying to see this- Wait, what? Well, yeah, I mean, I want to do something special for this countdown, so yeah, you're in. Oh. Well, all right then. I was ready for you to make a big fuss about it because it's your video. We're unnecessarily padding out the intro. Do you want in or not? Yeah, yeah, I'm in, I'm in. Please don't kick me out. It goes without saying that Nintendo is one of, if not the biggest name in the industry. Many of the major gaming icons that we know and love today are all thanks to Nintendo. And a few infamous names as well. But of course, the bigger the name, the harder the falls, and Nintendo's had more than its share of boo-boos. Not really stem from malicious intent, but really just gross negligence and a lack of foresight. Which I suppose is to be expected when you have to keep track of a company as big as this one. I've gotten comments by the dozens requesting I go through some of their blunders, and it's time to rip the band-aid off and cut this giant down to size. With a little help from me! Begrudgingly. In the 80s, the home video game industry in North America died due to a glut of terrible software produced by unauthorized publishers slash developers, flooding the market and effectively turning many customers and retailers off of gaming. Anyone could make a game, no questions asked, and sell it to anyone. How could Nintendo succeed in a dead industry, let alone revitalize it and restore people's trust in it? Well, Nintendo's brilliant idea was this. Don't let that little sticker fool you, we owe everything to it. Nintendo established a third-party licensing program that restricted how many games a publisher could release in a year. This meant that developers had to put their best foot forward, or not at all. It went as far as NES cartridges having to be made through Nintendo itself. Sure, some tried to circumvent it, but that quickly proved too difficult. Nintendo made it far more profitable to make games with long-term goals rather than to make a quick buck. Though, that didn't stop a lot of bad games from slipping through the cracks. Yeah, every generation has that shovelware target. If you happen to be the most popular gaming platform, everyone's gonna try and make a quick buck off your popularity and highly protect you if you happen to be a pre-licensed property. And boy, howdy, did we get a smorgasbord of crap games for the NES. Yeah, game development was still new, but it seems so many people were able to coast on the popularity of the NES and other licensed properties. And let's count our blessings. We never had anything like Custer's Revenge, so Nintendo's strategy worked, just not as well as everyone hoped. Unfortunately, the sticker eventually came into controversy. The term seal of quality implies that the game is good, and Nintendo came under some heat from salty nerds claiming false advertisement. This is why you rented before you bought in the 90s, kids. Anyway, Nintendo quietly changed the seal to read, Official Nintendo Licensed Product. So did that fix things? Nope. Fast forward a few years and oh man, there is a serious lack of quality control for the Wii. You know that limitation of how many games you can publish in a year on Nintendo consoles? Well, that doesn't really do much when you only need one game to make bank. Have you ever heard of Sturgeon's Law? It states that anything and everything can be considered art. But 90% of that art is utter crap. As much as I love the Wii, it definitely started pushing the boundaries of that adage. Seriously, finding a good third-party Wii game amongst the garbage was a chore, and this glut of kitty shovelware really prevented a lot of publishers from taking the console as seriously as Nintendo themselves did. I still remember the GT forum days where Wii is just a fad. And don't even get us started on the handhelds. I can't tell you how many bad games based on movies or TV shows were released for the Game Boy Advance and DS. The worst part is that it's still going on today. Seriously, the Nintendo eShop is filled with terrible ports of mobile games. But as much as we complain about this, to Nintendo's credit, they were able to reestablish some sort of standard. And again, this policy literally saved the industry. But there are days when we wish they were just a wee bit stricter. Now we all know that Nintendo is all about innovation, and sometimes we get some really amazing stuff. 
and other times we get some really weird sh Sometimes both. Now, there are so many embarrassing peripherals Nintendo has put out over the years that we could easily make a list dedicated to them alone. In fact... Wait a second, where are you going with this? Nintendo peripherals in 10 words or less. Ignore that. Only one game used this. Hyped, then vanished. Good, could easily abuse microtransactions. Only one game used this. Fire, fire, fire. Overhyped Nintendo Zapper made immortal by Smash Brothers. Fire, fire, fire. Cute but unnecessary gimmick made immortal by Smash Brothers. It's so bad. Well, at least the marketing's honest. It's Digimon Tamers, except you never have a full Digimon. You just spent 90 bucks on a weight scale. Congrats. And you thought the Genesis attachments were bad. Pay us money for plastic! Pay us money for cardboard! So glad Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles is getting a remake. Used by a lot of games. No one used it. Only one game used this. Selfie Generation a decade before it happened with bad filters. You only own this because you bought Link's crossbow training. At least it made Pokemon fans happy for a bit. You want to play DK64 and Majora's Mask? Useful at first, died off later. Incredibly niche. Though, personally, I love this damn thing. Mm -hmm. You would. Nintendo is a company that has had very strained relationships with third parties ever since the beginning. Even though the seal of quality policy helped revitalize the gaming industry, many third party developers weren't happy with it. For some of them, only being able to release five games a year, as well as being forced to develop games exclusively for Nintendo, felt very limiting, both for their profit margins and, in some cases, their creativity. But Nintendo controlled over 90% of the market, so they really didn't have a choice. But once Sega came along, oh lord, it got absolutely cutthroat. Due to Sega's aggressive marketing, third parties could now develop what they wanted without having Daddy Nintendo looming over them. Sure, the number of games they could develop were limited, but they weren't forced under any exclusivity contracts. It didn't help that Nintendo seemed to enjoy actively antagonizing other companies, <coughs> Sony, <coughs> and even got investigated for antitrust violations. But possibly the saddest example of this comes from Square. See, Square was with Nintendo from the beginning, with Final Fantasy being made for the NES. Since then, they made a lot of great games for the Super Nintendo, such as Final Fantasy VI, Chrono Trigger, and Super Mario RPG. They obviously had a close relationship with Nintendo, but then they had the idea for Final Fantasy VII. They realized that they literally could not make the game they wanted on a Nintendo console. Even if the fabled N64 DD was a success, Final Fantasy VII would have spanned 30 discs. Think of that the next time you whine about having to change discs. So they told Nintendo that they were going to develop Final Fantasy VII for Sony, and Nintendo's response was a very politically correct... No, get out of here! And never come back! Wow! Never thought Nintendo of all people would act like the jealous ex-girlfriend! That just adds 15 layers of complexity to Cloud being in Smash. I still called that years ago! And if you think it ends there... Well, it got worse. Because the N64 went with cartridges instead of the cheaper and roomier discs, as well as the Sony PlayStation being the new kid on the block ready and willing to have new games developed for it without super strict guidelines, third parties gleefully snubbed Nintendo. And the effects of this decision continued all throughout the GameCube's life cycle. Sure, they had some third party support during all this, including from Sega, weirdly enough. But given the competition from the newly developed Xbox, and how much the PlayStation 2 was dominating the market, Sometimes it felt like Capcom supported Nintendo out of pity. Then the Wii came along. At the start, nearly every third party took it as a joke, only pushing out gains at the faintest fart of an effort. Even after the Wii's popularity exploded, that still didn't stop third parties from only using Nintendo to make a quick buck, and only seemed to take the Xbox 360, PC, and PlayStation 3 seriously. Things didn't improve at all with the Wii U, as the confusing interface and poor marketing caused initially strong third-party support to slowly fizzle out. Hi, Ubisoft. Nowadays, things seem to have gotten a lot better. The Nintendo Switch has been nicknamed the Portable Port Machine, as many companies can seem to resist porting over their best games to the console. Hello, Undertale. Weirdly, Bethesda of all companies seems to be very intent on supporting the Switch. Seriously, we got Doom 2016 on a Nintendo console the family-friendly company. And on that note, can we be reminded that Bayonetta 2 would not exist if it weren't for Nintendo bringing her aboard the Wii U all those years ago? And given that Final Fantasy VII is being released on the Switch, 
I guess we can call that bygone bygone. That's how that word works, right? Nintendo's relationship with third parties has been unbelievably rocky since day one. From smothering them with overly strict guidelines until they leave, then being unable to be taken seriously as a platform, to finally not being able to get enough of Nintendo, this whole situation might as well be a weird roundabout allegory about a controlling father who alienated his kids, then embarrassed himself in trying to get them back, but eventually ending on a happy note. You know, I kind of want to see that now. Nintendo is known for being a little behind the rest of the world when it comes to trends and avenues to explore. While this has led to them innovating in a lot of areas, in others they tend to make mistakes that people corrected years ago. And nowhere is this more evident than how they view mobile gaming. Oddly enough, fans have been begging for mobile Nintendo titles for a long time. But Iwata-sama, rest in peace, was very adamant about not having Nintendo games be on mobile devices, stating, if we did this, Nintendo would cease to be Nintendo. Dramatic wording aside, he did admit that Nintendo would make some great short-term games if they entered the mobile scene. He was right. I don't think anyone was ready for how big Pokemon Go was going to be. Not even Nintendo. No disrespect to Niantic, but Nintendo basically funded this game with box tops and a prayer, and it shows! Gameplay depth of an Austrian Royals gene pool, frequent crashes, a near non-existent tutorial, and the worst sin for a Pokemon game? Absolute bare-bones interactions with other players. No trading, no one-on-one -on -one battling, nothing. And, of course, what happened at Pokemon Go Fest. We can't play! We can't play! We can't play! Seriously, bless the speakers for trying, but that was not their day. It wouldn't be until much later when Nintendo started taking the steps to make Pokemon Go the mobile monster it is today. And this would eventually lead them to develop other mobile games like Super Mario Run, Animal Crossing Pocket Camp, Dr. Mario World, and Fire Emblem Heroes. And something tells me that what came next is what Iwata-sama was worried about. Microtransactions are standard in mobile games, and it seems that not even Nintendo is immune to the insatiable sense of greed it creates. Some examples of this are the Fire Emblem Heroes Pass and Fire Emblem Heroes, which offer some quality of life features for a monthly fee. Pokemon Go sells cosmetics and boosts that you probably need for your Pokemon journey. And then there's Dr. Mario World, basically becoming Candy Crush Saga, where you spend real money on in-game currency to play a certain level. But the worst of this came with Mario Kart Tour. Admittedly, the idea of playing a Mario Kart game on your phone was pretty enticing, and it received a significant amount of downloads on launch. Unfortunately, the gameplay was awkward no matter what device you played it on, the amount of content initially available was sparse, and that leads into the microtransactions which were out of control. I had money once. It was an overrated experience. Now we understand that the mobile market and microtransactions go together like macaroni and cheese at this point, but that does not change the fact that there's a proper way to do it. Oh, perfect! I hate mobile gaming. When Nintendo strikes gold with a console, they really hit it home. The NES, the SNES, the blessed Switch. Even though the N64 had difficulty competing with Sony's PlayStation, we still got some of the greatest video games ever made on the thing, which defined many a childhood. The Wii as well. Yeah, a lot of the games are hit or miss, but the console itself delivered where it needed to. Just look at those sales numbers. Naturally, for all the smooth, satisfying turns on Nintendo's never-ending console journey, there are more than a few bumps. And no lie, Nintendo's bumps are pretty embarrassing. Case in point, the Virtual Boy. Back when virtual reality and 3D was still a newish thing, Nintendo decided to give it a go with their own attempt at VR. Binoculars. Aside from aesthetics, the console's main issue was that it barely even worked. It couldn't get the 3D effect right, and it was a major health hazard to anyone who even tried to use it. Headaches, nausea, neck issues. This thing was literally both an eyesore and a pain in the neck. Fortunately, Nintendo isn't above admitting that this thing was a train wreck. We don't joke about Virtual Boy. It's listening. Unfortunately, they're also not above poor marketing when it comes to other consoles. For a tragic fate hath befell the N64 Double D. It promised expanded game storage, online gaming, and even a creative outlet for artists and animators. 
That sounds too good to be true, right? Well, that's what Nintendo seemed to think because only a small amount of these things were actually sold, and an even smaller amount of discs were made before they just got pushed aside and cancelled altogether. They didn't seem to have any faith in this thing. That seems to be Nintendo's main problem with these console failures. Either the console is actually beyond saving, or they just gave up halfway through trying to promote it. And it didn't stop there. Looking back, the Wii U isn't actually a bad console. Eh, perspective, I suppose. But Nintendo did it dirty in the marketing department. Its console exclusive titles, if it had any, were slim to none. Third party support was practically null and void, and then there was that abysmal launch. We'll get to that later. In the end, it only sold like 13% of what the original Wii sold and finally discontinued in 2017. The gamepad's battery power also kind of sucked. Literally. But hey, give it credit, it had more to offer than the Wii Mini. The what? What was wrong with that? No backwards compatibility, no networking. You know what? I'll let Timmy finish my thought. You know what's really microscopic? How much I can! An interesting fact about Sony and Microsoft is that both have been observed muttering jealous remarks about the staying power of Nintendo's franchises. All things considered, they have a point. Most of Nintendo's biggest franchises like Mario, Zelda, and Pokemon have been around for literal decades and are still going strong today. Keyword most. So, what happens when you ask Nintendo to bring back some of their more neglected franchises? Come on, Reggie, give us Mother 3! How about this instead? I know that skit is pure hyperbole, but does Nintendo hate their niche franchises or something? Because if so, I have a few questions for Sakurai. Yeah, it's almost like Nintendo wants us to forget about some of their old franchises to a seemingly hostile extent. You want a new Rhythm Heaven? How about Golden Sun? Advance Wars? Chibi Robo? Custom Robo? Well, guess what? It ain't happening, despite a vast amount of gamers hammering at Nintendo to get on that cash cow. Seriously, Nintendo, you have a base of rabid fans that are begging to give you their money. Why don't you want our money? Shut up and take my money. I'm pretty sure this meme conjured itself into existence for you. Why don't you take the hint? It's only a game. Why do you have to be mad? And when Nintendo does release a game in these franchises, they often do so in a way that it feels like it belongs in the Malicious Compliance subreddit. Paper Mario Color Splash was a commercial failure, Metroid Federation Force was met with groans and face palms, and how many Star Fox remakes do we really need? Seriously, all you have to do is use the same gameplay formula from 64, give it a few new improvements and features, and slap it onto a new narrative. That is practically what you do with all of your other franchises, and it works. And the reason we give Nintendo crap for this is that they themselves have proven that reviving a dying franchise can lead to some serious success. Donkey Kong Country Returns brought the Big A back into the spotlight, and then there's Fire Emblem Awakening, which literally rekindled the Fire Emblem franchise into a global phenomenon. And don't even get me started on the mimetic zeitgeist known as Kid Icarus Uprising. I'm willing to bet that if they announce a new game in the Mother or F-Zero franchise, the fanbase will have no shortage of minds blown. Thankfully, with Super Smash Bros. Ultimate celebrating the history of gaming, and the Nintendo Switch proving to be a revitalizing platform for some long-forgotten games, perhaps this issue will be addressed soon enough. Here's hoping Metroid Prime 4 is good. And here we go with this song and dance again, E3, the most renowned gaming showcase in history, and the birthplace of many cringy, meme-worthy flops. And Nintendo has also had its share of triumphs and stinkers in this legendary land, Sometimes within the same conference. E3 2010 was probably Nintendo's best E3 conference. Epic Mickey, GoldenEye, Donkey Kong, and the 3DS with Ocarina of Time, Kingdom Hearts, and Kid Icarus. Though, it didn't start out too great. Skyward Sword unfortunately had some interference, and it was a painful, PAINFUL 10 minutes. Luckily, journalists got to demo it themselves and assured everyone that it not only works, but works well. But for a while, we were really scared. E3 2015 was another case of good and terrible. While featuring a lot of great 3DS games and some hilarious puppetry, this Direct was considered the nail in the coffin for the Wii U. The Wii U was starved for big games for a long time, and what we got to look forward to was... Mario Tennis Ultra Smash and Star Fox Zero. Oof. Then there was E3 2011, where the Wii U's initial trailer was... 
confusing to say the least. No one knew what to think of it, especially because it didn't explain the gamepad's capabilities and limitations all that well, which I'm pretty sure was the intended big selling point for the thing. But then there's the big one, quite possibly one of the worst E3 press conferences of all time, E3 2008. During this time, the Wii was doing well, very well. But with the slow decline of E3 quality since 2006, a lot of very loyal audiences had felt like they were being ignored in favor of the new casual market. With a sparse showing from the third parties and only Twilight Princess and Mario Galaxy under their belt, the more optimistic fans thought that Nintendo was saving their best stuff for E3. Beforehand, Reggie said that there were going to be three game announcements that hardcore gamers would be very interested in. What we expected was maybe F-Zero, Star Fox, an Okami sequel, or heck, everyone was talking about Kid Icarus. So what were the three hardcore games they were talking about? Star Wars The Clone Wars, Rayman Raven Rabbit's TV Party, and Call of Duty World at War. Oh yeah, because these totally have the same audience. Oh, it gets worse. I remember when the Wii Fit board came out, people said it would work great with a snowboarding game. Well, they gave us one at the beginning of this conference, but... By this point, interest in such a concept had evaporated. You should have led with that once you released the thing. Then there was the Wii Motion Plus, which was announced to a deafening silence. Why? Well, because this is them charging you an extra 20 bucks so they could deliver on the one-to-one -one motion control they promised back in 2006. Sure, we got a fun Wii Sports Resort demo with the jet skis, but before that, we spent so much time on throwing a frisbee to a dog. Safe to say, we felt a little patronized. You gotta admit, is that the most adorable game you've ever seen? I can't be courage to my car. And there wasn't much else at the conference that people really cared about. An underwhelming Animal Crossing sequel, a Guitar Hero game for the DS, and over 20 minutes of bragging about how much money and success they had, and paleing it up with their life stories. It was amazingly boring. Nearly an hour of conferencing and only four new games announced, few of which people were actually interested in. And then... Wait, the heights, smoke rising, and build up. Could this be? Kid Icarus? Nope. Wii music. As Nintendo fans saw their awkward, out-of-touch parents fail to drum properly and butcher the Super Mario Brothers theme, it really began to sink in that dark days were ahead. It was a sad time to be a Nintendo fan, as many truly felt like Nintendo had sold out to the soccer moms and abandoned the ones who got them where they are today. Nintendo lost a lot of their fan base's goodwill with this, and their reputation wouldn't really recover until the end of their kinda mediocre 2009 conference. Yeah, it eventually turned out to be a bad game, but looking back? Pretty much everyone forgave Nintendo once that trailer for Other M dropped. Oi, guess what Scorpio will be? Did you hear about these computer moms? They can operate in color! And they can branch out to folks all around the world conveniently and without issue! Well, raz my berries, that's some dandy technology. Why does a Nintendo get on horn with that? How about the foggiest? Even though time waits for no one, Nintendo's got a tendency to fall behind when it comes to online services. Right off the bat, online netcoding with Nintendo is a nightmare! The only games with decent online gameplay are Mario Kart and Pokemon. Sorta! Yeah, I actually hate the fact that you have to buy a separate piece of hardware just to play Smash Ultimate properly online. And even then, the sheer amount of frame delays makes Marvel vs. Capcom 3's online look good. And then there's Splatoon. Not only is there no team speak making communicating with your squad impossible, but it also had a punishment system set up for players who left matches early. Not a bad idea in theory, but the online netcode was so bad that disconnections were common and anyone who had an accidental disconnect got hit with the ban button almost instantly. And what's that? You want to play with your friends? No problem. All you need to do is enter your inconveniently long friend code and send them to your buddies elsewhere. I mean, it's not like other platforms like Steam have a friend request button that saves you all that trouble. Oh, wait. And I want to briefly touch upon the DLC real quick because Nintendo has an equal amount of awesome and terrible DLC. 
Getting to play them is a different matter. We will say this, however. They have grown a lot in terms of online shopping, starting from the Wii Shop with WiiWare. WiiWare. Yeah, that. You could download games straight to your console without having to step a foot out the door. And it would only continue to grow until we reached our most recent innovation, the Switch Online Shop and the Nintendo eShop. However, this only raises new problems. The online shops still have a few design flaws that make them a bit more inconvenient than they need to be, particularly the verification systems. Plus, I've noticed that Nintendo has been going a bit ham with the online subscriptions. Now, I'm not necessarily against paying an annual fee for online features, it is a service after all. But now Pokemon Home requires a subscription, and... It's not quite overboard yet, the pricing for these services is okay, but it's getting a little worrisome. And therein lies the problem. They'll force you to be online and then not put their best foot forward to make sure you can enjoy the experience. There are so many great online communities just waiting to get tapped into and Nintendo has no idea how to work with them. When did console gaming get so exhausting? If you've been creating content for YouTube for, I don't know, like 10, five, two years, then you're probably familiar with that. Uploading any kind of content involving an existing IP is pretty much impossible to do without upsetting some copyright holder every now and then. And for a while, Nintendo was one of the biggest crybabies. They were absolutely ravenous when it came to takedowns back in the day. And even though they relaxed a little in recent times, people still live in fear of Nintendo's laser-guided takedowns. Though to be fair, some people had it coming. But that doesn't excuse taking a dump on the fans who do these things out of love for the company. Because it's not like people making videos about your games can easily be a form of free promotion or anything. Now, Nintendo has definitely turned down the heat these days, but the Nintendo Creators program requires you to share a portion of your ad revenue with them, so it's not 100% perfect. Of course, YouTubers get off easy compared to the fan games. Just about every Nintendo fan game developer lives in constant anxiety that one day, they'll be the next one to receive the dreaded cease and desist. We've seen a ridiculous number of incredibly interesting looking games be yanked off the internet by them, usually before the game can even come out. Ocarina of Time 2D, please face wall. Pokemon Fusion Generation, please face wall. Pokemon Essentials, please face wall. Super Mario 64 HD, please face wall. Metroid to remake number I lost count, please face wall. Shadows of Lilith, please face wall. Star Fox Animated Series. Oh f no, we ain't having no furry degenerates. I'll do it myself. The worst part about all of this is that other game publishers have adapted to the times when it comes to fan creations. Namco commissioned a fan artist to promote Tales of Berseria. Capcom promoted a Mega Man fan game. And Sega brought on fan developers to create Sonic Mania which quickly became one of Sonic's most beloved games. Meanwhile, Nintendo actively refuses to adapt to the times. It's a real shame because when they do try a modern trend, they do create some good things. All the great and mostly free DLC and updates for Hyrule Warriors. Heck, Splatoon is technically Nintendo's online shooter. They can succeed, so it makes it a little more annoying when they blunder. On the flip side though, Cadence of Hyrule is a small step in the right direction regarding fan support, not to mention Sans and Cuphead appearing in Smash Brothers. Hopefully that's a sign of better things to come, but I'm not holding my breath. Shortages of Wii, Classics, and Amiibos. Technically a shortage is a good problem sometimes, but it does raise suspicions. New Play Control, trying to mix the old school GameCube controls with the newer Wii Remote controls is gonna get confusing fast. Not saving Rare. They knew not the terrors they allowed with their ignorance. They knew not! Accidentally banning Peach players in Smash Brothers. They did apologize for this one, but it's kind of scary how using a certain move can get you banned for an entire day. <clears throat> I'm a sundown for guests! And before anyone forgets, Nintendo has also been severely neglecting their Eastern marketing for almost three decades now. <laughs> Sure, Bolting Shaman, because you asked so nicely, I'd be glad to let you in. Yeah, it's really great. How'd you even get in? Oh, your window's open. Anyways, 
Regions down in Southeast Asia and the Middle East have yet to receive any concrete marketing service from Nintendo outside of imported products. We never properly obtained any range of Nintendo games from consoles like N64, GameCube, and Wii U within the internal market. And the ones we do get nowadays from Switch are usually stamped at import prices so high it's tricky to negotiate. Sony and Microsoft have no qualms putting their games on every shelf in these regions. So what's holding Nintendo up? Even Steam has marketing servers here. There's pretty much no reason to buy indie titles on Switch when you can get them dramatically cheaper the other way around. It's ironic that Nintendo's establishment traces all the way back to Singapore, but its region, including Malaysia, Indonesia, and more, never really got the recognition it deserves as a recipient for Nintendo's success. It's tough being a fan when you're living in a country where practically no one plays Nintendo games. Now granted, Nintendo is slowly owning up to it given that they're letting in more publicity for their products around here. But still, so many of us were left out on so many great Nintendo games to the point that the minority who caught on, such as myself, struggled to find a local community to unite with. Adding on to that, we've yet to get an adequate marketing server for eShop. And so long as even that's not out yet, this deserves to remain a concern. Are you sure they're not exaggerating? I mean, Nintendo can't be that negligent. I mean, pretty sure you got Pokemon in your country, right? The games, or the anime, toys, and everything else. Hmm. I rest my case. Number one. Most of the fails we've covered on this list so far have consisted of relatively recent blunders from Nintendo, and some of them have thankfully led to Nintendo learning from their mistakes. However, in order to find their greatest folly, we must journey far into the past, nearly 30 years ago. Is this an obvious number one? Nintendo wanted to create an add-on for the Super Nintendo that would allow it to play games from the far more powerful CDs. For reference, an SNES cartridge could hold about 4 megabytes, a CD could hold around 700. So to make this a reality, Nintendo struck a deal with Sony and would call it the Nintendo PlayStation. I would pay money to see that alternate timeline. Fast forward to 1991 at the Consumer Electronics Show, where Sony had already told the world that they were working with Nintendo. At their conference, Nintendo was expected to reveal the result of their collaboration with Sony to the gaming public. Instead, they revealed that they were cancelling their deal with Sony and that the add-on was being developed by Philips. <laughs> As for why this happened, it's a bit complex. To try and summarize while still getting all the nuances, Nintendo didn't like that Sony had the ability to make and sell games without buying them from the former. There are also some indications within the contract that Sony intended to eventually assimilate Nintendo, and Sony would also gain the rights to properties such as Mario and Zelda. So rather than try and renegotiate the nature of the deal with Sony, Nintendo decided to ruthlessly crush them. They straight up went behind their backs, struck a deal with Philips instead, and basically took all the ideas and assets for the shiny new console and left Sony out to dry, all the while publicly humiliating them in front of the entire world. Wow! Duh. Move, Nintendo! Sony now had nothing but an unfinished console. But instead of wallowing in their own self-pity, Sony tightened up their bootstraps and got to work. They took the concepts and the ideas that they got from working with Nintendo and eventually developed their own CD-based console. This would eventually become the Sony PlayStation. And what did Nintendo have to show for stabbing Sony in the back? Gee, it sure is boring around here. I hope she made lots of spaghetti. I wonder what's for dinner. When you pinch Wendy's pennies, they pinch back. Or else you will die. All toasters toast toast. After you've scrubbed all the floors in Hyrule, then we can talk about mercy. Ouch. Because of Nintendo's short-sightedness, one of the most powerful and lucrative names in the game industry was born, and bringing with it some of the most popular franchises. And because of Sony's less strict policies, beefier hardware, older demographic, and space-friendly CD formats seeming more appealing to third parties, the PlayStation absolutely crushed the N64. Meanwhile, the Philips CDI would go down in history as one of the worst consoles ever created. Well, that didn't work. Now don't get us wrong, the PlayStation itself is amazing. After all, it's home to some of our favorite games of all time. The fail here is that Nintendo ended up creating its greatest rival after Sega had shot themselves in the foot multiple times. Although, when you really think about it, 
this astronomical blunder might have ended up benefiting the gaming industry in the long run. Nintendo's cutthroat ruthlessness in their early life inadvertently created competition for themselves, causing both these companies to make greater strides to win fans. Not only did Sony thrive from this, but it also gave Microsoft the incentive to enter the industry too. Nintendo was no longer the dominant player in the game, and at the time, that was a good thing. It truly says a lot when, in the end, Nintendo's greatest failure ended up being one of the most wonderful things to ever happen to the gaming industry. Huh. This countdown ended on a good note. I'm the Fiery Joker. And I'm the Green Scorpion. And I wanted to thank everyone watching for... Warcraft 3 Reforged? What in the... Oh, for the love of... I just did that list! Blizzard, you couldn't have screwed this up earlier in the year? You know, do me a little bit of a favor? Come on! You're not gonna redo that list, are you? No, no, no. I'm not gonna redo an entire count. I'll just add another thing to the honorable mentions. It's not fair on the fans. It's not fair on the editors. Still, with the way these companies keep screwing up, it almost feels like I ended these fails lists too early. Seriously? There's still plenty of companies left. THQ, Atari, Bandai Namco, Tecmo Koei, all of them have done stupid things. Well, yeah, of course, but... Not enough for a top 10 that still manages to keep interesting. Eh, fair point. I mean, it's not like you can make a yearly countdown of fails across all companies. Hmm. Anyway, this is fun. Thanks, Joker. I mean, it's not like you can make a yearly countdown of fails across all companies. A yearly countdown of fails across all companies. Fails across all companies. Fails across all companies. Fails across all companies. Hmm. Cut! Hey everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. And consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member, and you'll get rewards like this. Our named shoutouts come from Luigi EXE Poor Man, Miserity Fox, and Misty Phantom. Thanks for watching.